Yet another way that College Board likes to test functions and their graphs is in terms of transformations. Uh, what we are talking about when we talk about transformations is this. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight that. A transformation just means that we're changing the position or shape of a function's graph by making certain changes to that function's equation or definition. Um, we did talk about this, I should say we touched on this back in section 12 when we discussed quadratics and especially uh, vertex form of a quadratic and how making certain changes to uh, vertex form could shift the parabola. You know, we, we might have a parabola um, whose vertex is at the origin and by making certain changes to the function here, we might, um, you know, maybe we move the vertex right a bit and up a bit and we end up with this parabola over here. So that is known as a translation. That's a specific kind of transformation. Transformation is a more general term encompassing all of the changes that we could make to the graph of a function. Translation simply means, and I'm going to highlight this down here, translation is the shifting or sliding of all points on a graph or on a figure the same distance and in the same direction, uh, which will result in the graph simply shifted or slid to another part of the xy plane. We covered the translation rules back in section 12. We're going to reiterate them here. So when it comes to function graph translation rules, if we add or I'm going to highlight some stuff here too. If we add or subtract a certain constant, a certain value to the y or f of x values, in other words, to the y or the function's value, we will see on the graph a vertical, a vertical shift, a vertical translation. If we add a value to f of x, keep in mind all of these f of x's are synonymous with y. So if we add a value to f of x or we add a value to y, the graph will let's write down shift shifts graph up up k units so whatever that k value is we will see the graph move up that k value so if that k value is two all of the points on the graph will shift up two units and of course if we do f of x minus k if we subtract a constant or a value from the y value or from the function value that will shift i'm going to write shifts graph down down k units and what that means in terms of the actual points is that if your original point on the graph is x comma y well obviously when you add k to all of the y values you are going to see that x y point go to x comma y plus k. Again, that should be pretty intuitive. You are adding a k to all of the y values, so all of your points will just shift up k units, which means you will add you will be adding k to all of your y values. And of course, if your original point on the graph is x y, the new point on the shifted or translated graph will be x comma y minus k. These points over here you you may see referred to as the image points, um, although image is usually re reserved for reflections, I believe. But uh, when we talk about points on the new graph, on the shifted or reflected graph, we are talking about the image points. Um, in terms of adding to or subtracting from x, this is, I think this is probably one of the trickiest places when it comes to transformations and specifically to translations. Um, so first of all, what does adding to or subtracting from x do generally? It results in horizontal shift. So when we are adding or subtracting a value to or from y, we are going up and down. So vertical shift. By the way, I'm going to write this up here. I suggest you do the same. So when we add a value, we go up. When we subtract a value, we go down. When it comes to adding or subtracting values from x, we result in horizontal shifts. And here's the sort of tricky part. When we add a value to the x value, so notice that up here, the k that we were adding was outside of or after the set of parentheses. But here, 
we're adding that value, that H value to the X itself. In other words, the adding and subtracting is going on right there in the parentheses. We're adding again directly to X itself. When we add a value to X, what we do is we shift the graph left, left H units. And when we subtract a value from X, we shift the graph right H units. Now listen, in the interest of time, and because of how these questions tend to get tested on the SAT, I'm not going to show you why this is the way it is. If you want a video on why it is the way it is, there are plenty available. It's actually, once it gets explained, it's not all that difficult to understand why a adding results in a shift left because you you would expect that adding something would you know put you right or, or, or sort of in the positive direction but that's actually not what happens when we add something to h we go left and like i said um, it's not all that difficult to understand why that happens if uh, this process is written out for you or explained to you but because of the way that these questions tend to get tested on the sat my recommendation to you is to simply memorize these rules and make sure you have them down cold. So now what happens over here is because we are shifting the graph left, that means that our original point on the original graph xy will be xy, but the translated point will be x minus h, right? We are shifting all of the points left. Well, keep in mind if we go from I don't know, let's say this is the point two, one. If we shift this point left a certain number of units, let's say it's, I don't know, three units to the left, then we are going to be at negative one, comma one. Well, if that two was your original X, this guy over here, this negative one, you notice that that is going to be X minus three. X minus three, right? Two was the original X minus three gives us that negative one. So the the points, the translated points on the new curve, when we add something to the X in parentheses will be X minus H comma Y. The Y does not change if we don't add or subtract anything to the F of X value. Um, if we only add or subtract to the X value, then only the X coordinates will change. And of course, over here we will have X plus H comma Y. So again, Adding to H, I'm sorry, adding to X in parentheses will cause all of your X points to go to X minus H and subtracting from X in parentheses will cause all of your points to go to X plus H. So this is a horizontal shift and keep in mind that subtracting from X will make you go right and adding to X will make you go left. That one is definitely counterintuitive, but that's the way that it works. And if you need more explanation, you've got to seek out additional resources or ask your tutor. Let's take a look at an example. Example 13, if you're comfortable with translations, transformations, and you understood everything we just said, you might want to go ahead and do 13 on your own. So pause the video and then come back and join us. In example 13, sketching a translation, we've got the graph of the function f shown in the xy plane above. Okay, so this guy right here is uh, y equals f of x, uh, where y equals f of x, that's what they say right there. Uh, the function g is defined as g of x equals f of x plus three minus two, and we wanna sketch the graph of g, sketch graph of g. So you notice that the g function is just being defined in terms of the f function. And all that's happening is that the g function is the f function, except we are adding something to the x value of the f function, and we are subtracting something from the f of x value of the f function. So all we have to do here is remember the rules that we just learned. Let's deal with this minus two first. Remember that subtracting something from f of x itself, remember that like this whole thing here is the f of x, the f and the parentheses that follow. So we're subtracting two. Remember that moves us down two. That moves all of our points down two. In other words, all of our y values on the original f function will go down two. And then this in here, this x plus three, remember that's the sort of tricky one that adding will 
make us move, we'll shift all of our points left three units, right? So we'll get x minus three. So all we have to do is take the points that we're given here or the curve that we're given here. We've got to go down two. We've got to go over three, left three. So our new vertex will be there. This point right here, let's just use the points that they give us instead of trying to sketch this graph. Down two, left three, and then this point here, down two, left three. So it looks like our translated parabola will be this here. So all we have done is we've taken the original f of x function, and because g of x was described in terms of f of x and described as simply a couple of translations of f, we know that our g of x function will be over here uh, to the left and below the original function. So that's a fairly straightforward example of sketching a translation. Example 14 is a little bit trickier. Again, if you're feeling confident, if you feel like you understand all this stuff, go ahead and do it on your own. If not, just watch me work through it right now. The graph of the function g is shown in the xy plane above. Okay, so again, this is uh, y equals g of x. They tell us that in the very next phrase here. The functions g and h are related such that g of x equals h of x minus three plus four, and we wanna sketch the graph of h. So here's the tricky thing. What a lot of students will do on a question like this is they'll take the g of x function and they will move the g of x function according to these translations. And that is part of how you would solve this question, but you've gotta understand that the g of x function is actually the h of x function translated. In other words, it, it's almost as if the h of x function was the original function and we have moved that h of x function to get the g of x function. So if h of x was our original function and g of x equals h of x minus three plus four, that means that our original h of x function shifted right three and up four to get the g of x function. So this g of x function resulted when we moved h of x right three, uh, right three and up four. So right three and up four, which means that this point right here was originally here. This point right here, left three, up four, one, two, three, four, was there. And this, so that's the vertex right there. And this point over here, we went right three and up four. So that point had to be there, which means the original h of x function had to be down here. So if that's the original h of x function, then the g of x function, again, would be moved right three and up four, which would result in the g of x function that was plotted here originally. So the h of x function is going to be uh, is going to be over here, uh, this guy down here. Next, we have um, oh, by the way, in terms of calculator use on these questions, um, you will see translation and other transformation questions on section four, the calculator section. Although the way that College Board tends to ask these, like in example 14, make it somewhat difficult to use the calculator. If by some chance you forget the rules for shifts, for translations, you can use your calculator to remind you of those rules in the following way. So what you would do is you might make up a function. So I'm gonna actually scroll back up here to example 13. So what I am going to do here is I'm gonna go into my graphing menu. I am going to clear out whatever I have in there. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do something very simple. I'm gonna do maybe x squared, so regular old parabola. And then down here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do something like, let's see what we got here. We got a plus three added to the x and a two subtracted from the y. So what that would look like in terms of this original x squared function is it would look like this x plus three squared. So notice there again, I am adding directly to the x value and then I am subtracting two from that entire function from uh, sort of the, the original y value. And when I graph this, 
the blue graph is going to be my original and the red will be my new one. When I graph this, I can see that I have shifted left three and down two. It should be pretty clear from the graph. If I wanted to, I could hit a trace or start trying to find out what some of these specific points are. I could even find the vertices using my, my calc menu, but it should be pretty clear that I've gone one, two, three to the left and one, two down from the blue vertex to the red vertex. So what I'm saying is that yes, there are probably some cases where you can either use the calculator outright or you could at least make up a function. You notice that in example 13, there's no actual function given. We're just given how G is defined in terms of F, but we don't have the actual function. But what I did here is I just made up a function and I was able to see on the graph how the changes that I made to the function, the plus three to the X, the minus two to the Y, I was able to see how those changes to the function affected the graph. So that might remind me of what some of the rules are if indeed I have forgotten those rules. Next page, at the top of the next page, we have stretches and compressions. So this is yet another type of transformation where we take a graph and we stretch it or we compress it either horizontally or vertically. These questions are relatively rare. Vertical compressions are much more common than horizontal compressions. I'm not sure that I've ever even seen a horizontal compression show up on the test, but we are going to cover horizontal compressions because there is a chance you will see those transformations as well. So when it comes to function graph stretches and compressions, we are talking about constants that we are multiplying either by our y value, our f of x value, or constants that we multiply by the x value, the thing in parentheses. So let's deal with the, the situations on the left first, multiplying by the y or f of x value. So if we take a constant, some, some value, here we call it a, and we multiply that value by an original function, by an f of x function, what we do is we first of all act in the vertical direction, and if A is greater than one, that's gonna be a vertical stretch. So if I were to take the this function over here, now by the way, we are using what looks to be a, a wave-like or trigonometric function over here. College Board could test any kind of function. They could test quadratics, they could test cubics when it comes to transformations. You just need to know in general what happens to the graph. Um, and, and then you will be able to apply those rules to any type of function that they ask you about, whether it be quadratic or exponential, it doesn't really matter. So what's gonna happen here, if we take y equals f of x, and we multiply that f of x by an a value, so in other words, if we go from uh, you know x squared to two x squared, or we went from uh, sine of x to two sine of x, Again, doesn't matter what we're doing is we're taking some function and we're multiplying that function by a constant that is greater than one. What happens is that we get a vertical stretch. So what I'm gonna do, I am not and have never been very good at drawing trigonometric functions. Oh, this is turning out pretty well. It's especially hard digitally. Um, so what we do is we stretch the graph. It's almost as if we're like pulling on these points and pulling on these points you know, we're pulling these points up, we're pulling these points down, we're stretching the graph so that the graph becomes um, steeper or skinnier. Uh, we are vertically stretching the graph. In terms of multiplying the function by a value of a that is a fraction, that is in between zero and one, that is a vertical compression. So what that would do is instead of pulling on this point, this point, this point, and this point, we would push on them, and we would end up with a graph that maybe, oops, looks something like that. Uh, that didn't turn out very well. Um, yeah, that's ugly. I gotta, I gotta do that again. That's a little bit better, yeah. Um, so we are compressing the graph. We're making it flatter or less steep. Um, that's what multiplying a function by an a value that is between zero and one will do. Now, when it comes to multiplying x by a certain constant, we're gonna call that constant b here, these are horizontal changes. Now, if b is greater than one, we no longer will get a stretch, we will get a compression. And what that means is that this graph that has right now what, what sort of one hump, two humps, three humps, four humps, uh, we're going to get 
a graph that is much more wavy, the wavelength will um, shrink. So we'll get something like that. Again, not the prettiest um, compression there, but uh, what we are doing is we are sort of pushing in from the right and the left, um, from the right and the left, and we are getting a graph that has many, many more uh, peaks and troughs, many more waves. Uh, when we have a B value, so if we're multiplying X by a v, B value that is between zero and one, in other words, as a fraction, here we get stretching. So this is a horizontal stretching. So what would happen is instead of more waves, we would get uh, less waves, something like that. So the, the waves sort of stretch out, we get a bigger wavelength. That's what happens when we multiply the X value itself by a constant between zero and one. Again, not commonly seen on the SAT, these horizontal compressions and stretches, vertical stretches and compressions will show up every now and then. Now we have to talk about reflections. Uh, reflections also are not all that common on the test. Uh, these two, basically just two rules though, should get you through the vast majority of reflection questions if they do show up. Um, if we multiply f of x, f of x itself, or the x itself by a negative, and whether that be a negative one or a negative 10 or a negative 0.5, it doesn't matter. If we multiply by a negative, we're gonna get reflections across either the horizontal x-axis or the vertical y-axis. So if we take f of x, in other words, our y values, and we multiply those y values by a negative, we are going to get, uh, let's do reflects over x-axis. We're going to get horizontal reflection or x-axis reflection. In other words, this y value right here will go there. This y value right here will go down there. This y value up here will go down there. And our graph as a whole will end up down here. And that should make perfect sense because if we are multiplying, let's say, you know, this y value right here looks like it's one, let's say. If we're multiplying all of our y values by negative one, then that one becomes negative one, which means our point just goes from positive one to negative one. So again, if we multiply f of x itself by a negative, we will, we will reflect the entire graph, all of the points on the graph over the x-axis. By the way, it works the other way. If I had, I'll just do a, a, a little, I don't know, something like this over here. If we had this graph and we multiplied this graph, the y values on this graph by a negative, everything would end up over here. Again, we would just reflect over, over the x axis. Uh, when it comes to multiplying our x value itself by a negative, this is going to be reflection over, all right, reflects over uh, y axis. So this will sort of be a horizontal reflection where all of our x values are multiplied by whatever that negative value is, and they will go over here. In this case, we are just multiplying by negative one, just so you know. If you were to multiply a function by, uh, I don't know, negative two, not only would all of your original y values be multiplied by that negative, you would also have a stretch. So you'd just be com combining two of the transformations that we've talked about here. So again, this point is gonna go over here, this point is gonna go over here, and this point is gonna go over here. So we will end up with our graph reflected over, over that vertical axis. The y-axis will be sort of a mirror and we will be uh, reflecting over that mirror. In other words, you know, if this were point A, point A's reflection would be over here, I'm gonna call it A prime or the image of A. Uh, I mentioned before that you may see, you may actually see that language image, I think might be worthwhile to write that down. Image of A. When we reflect, uh, for instance, in a mirror, you see your image in the mirror. So this is the image of the original point A in the mirror that is created by the y-axis. When it comes to absolute values, uh, not all that common, again, yet, yet another situation that's not gonna commonly show up on the test. Um, and technically, absolute valuing a function is in a math te textbook, this probably would not fall under the category of transformations. 
we are covering what absolute values do to graphs here because they do act somewhat like uh, transformations. So if we take the absolute value of a function, so that's what those bars are, absolute value of f of x, what absolute valuing this function will do, what absolute valuing any function will do is reflect all points below the x-axis. In other words, we're talking about uh, quadrants. So remember your quadrants, one, two, three, and four. Anybody who's been doing a lot of unit circle stuff should be very familiar with those quadrants. One, two, three, four. So we're talking about quadrants. I'll write quads uh, three and four. So it reflects it will reflect all points below the x-axis in those two quadrants uh, over the x-axis and into, I'll put this in parentheses, and into quadrants. So three would go to two and four would go to one. And that should, again, make fairly intuitive sense. Keep in mind that, for instance, I'll, I'll use a fairly concrete example. You know, this point right here, if that point is, let's just say it's one, two, three, let's say the scale is, these are all one unit. So that's th negative three, negative two. Negative three, negative two. Remember, we've said several times in this section that the y value is synonymous with, uh, let's just say the f of x value. That's what we've got here. The y value equals the f of x value. So if we absolute value, the f of x value, and f of x equals negative two, which is what it equals at that point. Well, the absolute value of negative two equals two, which means that this point, nothing's gonna happen to the x value. The x value will stay exactly the same, but this point here, I'll do this over here, is going to go to negative three comma two. Nothing's gonna happen to the points above the x axis. In other words, the points that have a positive y coordinate because when you absolute value a positive number nothing happens you just get the same positive number so this point here will reflect up here into quadrant two this point here reflects up here this point here reflects up here okay so again we're just reflecting across the x-axis and then this point down here will reflect all the way up here and what we will end up with is we will end up with a curve that looks kind of funky. We'll get some sort of sharp turns, sharp bumps, and we'll end up with something like that. So you notice all that has happened here, if you wanna look at this in a little bit of a larger picture, although I definitely recommend sticking just to the, the points themselves, the individual points themselves might be easier to look at. But if you wanna look at this in a little bit of a larger view, you can see that like, for instance, this little portion here that I am outlining in blue has just been reflected above the x-axis to this portion in light blue. Dark blue goes to light blue. That is a reflection across the x-axis. So that's what happens when we absolute value a function. We just get x-axis reflection. We all the parts, uh, sorry, well, all the parts that are below the x-axis reflect above the x-axis. All the parts that were already above the x-axis, nothing happens to those. They stay exactly the same. At the top of the next page, we have a, an entire page that summarizes all of these transformations. My suggestion to all students is to make sure that you have this information memorized. Would it be good to also understand why all of this stuff happens? Yes, absolutely. Uh, try to understand it. If you need additional resources, if you need to ask your tutor why some of this stuff happens or for more clarification as to why it happens, great, go ahead and do that. But for the purposes of the SAT, in most cases, as long as you have this information, this summary page, as long as you have it memorized, you're probably gonna be fine on most of these questions. I will say most transformation questions stick to horizontal and vertical translations. The vertical stretches probably tend to be second most common. I would say the stuff at the bottom of the page underneath vertical stretches, uh, not a not a great probability that you're gonna see many or any of those types of transformations, but I would still know them just in case. At the top of the next page, we've got a, 
start talking about domain and range. Domain and range questions, also not all that common on the test. You do have to have some sense of what a domain and a range are uh, and, and uh, what some of the implications of certain functions are on a domain and a range of that function. So let's talk about domain. Uh, domain is all allowable x or input values, that's supposed to be a v, for a function. Now there are many, many, many functions out there that have the domain all real numbers. For instance, any linear function, like y equals 2x plus 3. I can throw whatever the heck I want into that function for x. And, and indeed, when we graph a line, a line is, you know, it's an infinite uh, line. It doesn't stop. There's no gaps. There's no places where the line sort of jumps from one place to another. And v you can see visually that what's going on there is that any value of x can be thrown in to this function. Uh, again, remember this could be written as f of x equals 2x plus 3. Any value of x can be thrown into this function and we will get an output value. We will get a y or f of x value. However, there are certain functions, more complicated functions, that do have certain characteristics that will make certain values of x or input values not work. They will somehow blow the function up. For instance, uh, and again, for those of you that have taken Algebra 2 and certainly those of you who have taken pre-calculus, this should all be review for you. Um, any input value that does either of these two things that we're about to write down have to be excluded from the domain. We're going to talk about the, the two major things that will blow up a function, that will make a function not work. The first and, and more common is any input value that will make the denominator of a function equal zero. So for instance, if I had the function one over x minus three. So if a function has a denominator and that denominator can, denominator can be made to equal zero by a certain value of x and here, the way that I would figure out that value of x is I'll just set the denominator equal to zero, I'll add three to both sides and I get x equals three. So it is that value of x that will make this denominator equals zero, which means that this value of x right here cannot be part of the domain because when the denominator of a fraction is zero, we get an undefined result. One over zero is called undefined. We don't know uh, what that means. And the reason we don't know what that means is because a lot of students actually don't know this very simple uh, uh, reason that denominators equaling zero will make things undefined. Remember that what division, what one of the ways, one of the simple ways to think about division is what do we have to multiply this three by to get this 12? What do we have to multiply that denominator by to get 12? Well, it's four, right? I that That's why this equals four because four is the number that I multiply three by to get that 12. Well, what number do I multiply zero by to get one, the answer is we have no idea. How the hell can you multiply zero by anything and get anything other than zero? You cannot multiply zero by anything to get one and therefore we call this scenario undefined. So in this function right here, when x is three, the denominator is zero and when the denominator of, of a fraction is zero, we have something that is undefined which means we have to exclude x equals three from the domain of this function. So what we would say maybe is that the domain of this function is all real numbers except three. That would be the domain of this function. The other maybe slightly less common input value that will make a, uh, or that we need to exclude from the domain of a function is any x value that will make a negative value under a square root. In other words, anything that will create a negative uh, radicand. Remember, we call the thing under the square root the radicand. We learned that back in the 
exponents and radicals section, anything, any value of x that will make a negative radicand will need to be excluded from the domain of a function because remember, so for instance, I'll use that x minus three again. So I'll do this, I'll write x minus three is greater than or equal to zero and add the three, add the three. So x is greater than or equal to three. So what I just found right here is that any x value greater than or equal to three will make this radicand greater than or equal to zero, which means that anything that is less than three will make this radicand negative. For instance, if I throw in two for x, I get root negative one. And what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that's not a real number. And therefore, since I'm not getting a real number, I have to exclude the any x value that is less than three from this domain. So we might say that the domain of this function is x is greater than or equal to three. Generally, when we're talking about this first situation, this you know input values that make the denominator of a function equal to zero, generally what we are talking about doing is we are talking about setting the denominator. Keep in mind if the function doesn't have a denominator, if the function is sort of all on one line, then we don't have to worry about this. This is only when functions have a denominator. We set the denominator polynomial, whatever expression is in the denominator, we set that equal to zero and we solve for x and those x values have to then be excluded from the domain because those are the x values that will make that denominator equal to zero. So on number 15, again, pause the video if you wanna do this on your own, I'm gonna work through it right now. So what we have to consider here in finding the domain of f, that's what they're asking us, is what x values will make this denominator equal to zero because those x values need to be shut out of the domain. So what do I do? I take x squared minus x minus six, I set it equal to zero. And then whatever way you want to, by the way, notice that what this is, this is a quadratic equation. We learned many, many methods for solving quadratic equations for finding these zeros or the roots of this equation, we could use the quadratic formula. There are some calculator methods that we can use because this is a fairly simple quadratic in standard form. I'm gonna use factoring. I think that probably would be the easiest. We know that there needs to be x's in that first, uh, in each first position to get that x squared. And then six is either one and six or three and two, but because this negative one in front of that uh, linear term, I know this is gonna be a three and a two, and one needs to be positive, one needs to be negative. It looks like the two will need to be positive and the three will need to be negative because positive two minus three will give me that uh, that that one there. So I realized I, I didn't really use any of the techniques that I spent time talking about in section 12 there, but um, certainly a little bit of just trial and error, a little bit of visual inspection, I, I think is the easiest way to go here. So what does that mean? That means that X equals, three, that's the zero that corresponds to that factor. X equals negative two is the zero that corresponds to this factor. So the domain of this function is going to be any X value except these two. So we might write something like all real values, all real numbers, except uh, negative two and three. Um, so X cannot equal negative two and x cannot equal three. Those are the values that need to be excluded from the domain. When it comes to those square root functions, already sort of uh, pointed this out, the easiest way to uh, figure out what we can't use for x, in other words, what x values will produce a negative under the square root and therefore a non-real result, we just set the stuff under the square root um, in an inequality, we set it greater than or equal to zero that will give us the, the domain of the function. So I'm gonna take the radicand, which here is that negative x plus two. I'm gonna say, okay, that has to be greater than or equal to zero. It cannot be negative or else I'll get a non-real result. So let me, I'll just add the x's to both sides. So the domain of this function, I'm gonna flip that around. Gotta be careful when you do that, is simply x is less than or equal, less than or equal to two. Any value of x that is uh, greater than two is going to produce a negative under here. For instance, if x equals three, negative three plus two under the square root, negative three plus two is negative one, and indeed, I'm going to get uh, an imaginary number. Let's talk a bit about range down at the bottom of the page, and then we will wrap this up. When it comes to range, what we should know is that this is all possible values of of your output 
which remember we've talked many times about the fact that output is synonymous to, with y and that is synonymous with f of x. So all possible values of the output of y of f of x or of the function, all possible values of the function. Remember that the function's value is synonymous with all three of these uh, things as well. I'll write that down. All possible values of the function. Usually these questions are going to boil down to what we learned again in section 12. A lot of overlap between this section and section 12. Um, and, and what I mean by that is we very frequently will be uh, if we do see a question that's testing range, th these questions are fairly rare, but if we do see a question testing range, most likely what's going to go on is you you may be given a quadratic and you should recognize this as vertex form. So first of all, they're asking us for the range here. So that's vertex form. Uh, remember that in vertex form, we have an a x minus h squared plus k. And we learn that uh, H and K will give us the coordinates of the vertex. And A, A tells us a couple things, but one of the things it tells us is whether we are going, uh, we are opening downwards. In other words, whether our vertex is a maximum or are we opening upwards and our vertex is a minimum. So let's deal with the A first. We can see that A equals negative three. So we know that this parabola is going to be facing downwards. In other words, that the vertex is a maximum. And we should be able to see that the vertex here is uh, h comma k. So it's going to be negative 2 comma 4. Keep in mind that x plus 2 is the same as x minus negative 2. And x minus negative 2 matching up to x minus h means that the negative 2 is the h. So we have a vertex of negative 2 comma 4, negative 2 comma 4. So that just means if all of the other y values on this parabola are below negative four, right? We head downward, head downward. So negative four is the maximum. That's the maximum value of the function of f of x in this case. So all of the other y values will just be less than or equal to four. We are at four. And then all the other y values are below that because this is a downward facing parabola. So we could write y is less than or equal to 4. We could write f of x is less than or equal to 4. So that's how a range question might look. Again, it really just has to do with knowing uh, the ins and outs of quadratics, their forms, in this case vertex form, and, and possibly a little bit about, uh, or I shouldn't say possibly a little bit, a lot about uh, parabolas, their vertices, their ma maximums, their minimums. So that's basically it for um, domain and range and, and translations. Uh, these questions, as I said, some of them are fairly common. Uh, translation questions will show up fairly commonly uh, on the test, but a lot of this stuff will show up once in a blue moon. And, you know, again, if you're somebody who's really gunning for a top, top score, we're talking, you know, above 750 on the math. Yeah, you should probably be familiar with all of this so you don't give up any unnecessary points. And I will say once again that although I, I hate to encourage just pure and simple memorization, there are some cases here where if you do just have this stuff memorized, you're probably going to be fine on a lot of these questions. Certainly go ahead and, and try to get the underlying fundamentals grasped and understood and mastered, but um, some memorization will, will definitely do you good here.